I'm checking and testing, checking, testing, checking, testing, checking, testing. Hi, this is Michelle again with Life After Choice. We'll take it in small bites. This is the most holy season of the Jewish calendar. It's the High Holy Days, and I want to talk to you about atonement in honor of the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. I want to talk about atonement by speaking about a movie that I just watched. It's called One Child Nation, and it's about the one-child policy in China. It's a movie by Nanfu Wang and Jialing Zhang. They've made a documentary to discuss these years between 1979 and 2015, when China was very concerned about famine amongst their population because of population growth. So they instituted a policy that required that families have only one child. If you feel like you're going to go out and watch this movie, you need to know that it's got a lot of really disturbing images in it. In fact, it's rated R for disturbing images. A wonderful personality that we meet in the film, his name is Peng Wang, he's an artist. He spoke about the communist collective mentality, which really destroys individuality, it destroys humanity, and it destroys conscience. So that's a very important piece when we come to meet a midwife who was one of the enforcers of the one-child policy. Now, this was not voluntary, but what was required in order to maintain the one-child policy was forced abortions and forced sterilizations. This even took place if the children in the belly were, you know, fully late term, really late term. The women they said were dragged like pigs to these uh, clinics where they were forced to be aborted and sterilized. So this midwife was in the employ of the government for 20 years and during that time she performed between 50 and 60,000 abortions. Now how did she know that? She actually kept count. And why did she keep count? Because her conscience wasn't fully dead. In fact she was really plagued with guilt. When she retired after her 20 years, she chose to work in the field of infertility. Now, why did she choose infertility? Well, in her own words, she wanted to atone for the sins of all the killings that she had performed. Now, she says that some people sort of let her off the hook because she was working for the government. She was just following orders. It was something she had to do. But she says, I'm the one that was the executioner. I'm the one that did the killing. So one day she encountered a 108-year-old monk who told her that if she worked in the field of infertility, every child that she enabled to be born would atone for a hundred that she killed. And that really stuck with her. And so now when she shows you her home and she takes you on a tour of her house, the walls are covered with these red celebration banners that are intended to uh, announce the birth of a child and to each banner there's a little uh, picture a photograph of a baby affixed so that you can see that she is really uh, very intent on atoning for what she did so let's figure that out if she did 50,000 abortions and the monk told her that each live birth that she enabled through her infertility work was worth a hundred that means that she would have to come up with 500 live births to atone for the 50,000. She worked in this field for 27 years. It's very likely that she hit that number of 500. She probably went way past 500. But do you suppose there was ever a time where she was able to just say, okay, I've washed my hands of that debt. No more burden there. She still carries that burden even though she long ago probably met the monk's suggested 500 count. Is there ever a point for you and me when we say, okay, well, all by myself, I've taken care of my sin, I've put it behind me, it's no longer an issue. No, I don't think so. I don't think we ever get to that point all on our own. And why is that? Because we don't have the power to atone for ourselves. Let me explain it to you this way. When you commit a crime, whether it's a parking violation or something really huge, you owe a debt to society. And when you pay your parking fine or you serve time in prison, you pay your debt to society. 
Your crime creates a debt. Well, so it is in the spirit realm. That's the way our sin works. It's a sin debt. And we don't have the power to pay it ourselves. This is where Jesus comes in. Let's learn from the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest was able to go into the Holy of Holies only once a year. And on this day, there were two goats that were sacrificed. One was slain and its blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat inside the Holy of Holies. The other was banished out of the camp to wander until it perished. Now, when we look at the high priest and we look at the sacrificial animals, we see a prefiguring of Jesus himself because he is the high priest, but a better high priest. He's offering us an atonement that's not just for one year, but it's actually for all time. So he's the high priest that rent the veil. The veil was his very body so that we now have access to the Holy of Holies and that mercy seat of God by his blood. He was the goat that was sent and banished out of the camp because Golgotha, where he was crucified, is outside the camp of Jerusalem. And he was the goat that was slain whose blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. I'm going to read to you now from Hebrews 9. Verse 11, but when Mashiach, or Christ, appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, you see, he's the high priest, the better high priest, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, not once a year, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So when I think of this midwife, and when I think of me and you and everyone, I I am so rejoicing that we have a way. We have a way of atonement. We can't do it ourselves. I wish I could just call this lady up or just run over there to China and tell her, you have an atonement. It's not something that you can make for yourself, but you have it in Yeshua. Hamashiach, Jesus, the Christ, the Anointed One. You know, the Day of Atonement is not normally considered a day of rejoicing. But when we think about the atonement that we have in Yeshua, we do have reason to rejoice and even feast after we're done with our fasting. Let's pray. Oh, Abba, Father, we thank you that you have atoned for our sins through your work since you see that our methods fall short. We can't atone for ourselves. We can't bear the burden of our sin debt. You tell us, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Lord, we say yes to that rest. We come to you. We accept what you offer. Amen. Get in touch with me if you've prayed that prayer. And in the meantime, we're preparing the next video in the Life After Choice series, and we'll see you next time.